What do you think of when you hear the word chemistry? Chances are you may think of a researcher creating the next world-changing polymer. Maybe a doctor carefully selecting a drug dosage for a critically ill patient, or an engineer deciding what sort of lubricant or gas to use in his or her latest device. Now dig a little deeper and you may contemplate how a firework detonates over the skies of Washington, D.C., producing a spectacular display of color and motion. Or how the almost microscopic bulbs of gas in a plasma TV emit light in response to electrical stimulation, creating a high-definition image for viewers to enjoy. Now really let your imagination run and think about the greatest chemist of all, Mother Nature. The metallic core of the Earth generates a magnetic field to protect us from solar radiation. A geothermal vent at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean pours hot, mineral-rich water into the frigid surroundings of the seafloor. This provides dissolved nutrients to sustain life in an environment nearly incomprehensible to us. Dinosaur bone near the surface of the Earth mineralizes over tens or even hundreds of millions of years leaving evidence of a long extinct inhabitant of the early Earth. Maybe a tiny crystal of radioactive mineral is formed billions of years ago, slowly but consistently decomposing, giving us a tiny clock with which to measure the age of the planet itself. Now, we all know that these processes are taking place all around us, but understanding how each of these processes truly works requires that we understand the science of chemistry. I want to welcome you to this course on chemistry, a course that will touch on these and many, many more practical applications of what those in the field refer to as the central science. It's a fitting name, as it should be clear from our examples that there are very few things which cannot be studied from the perspective of a chemist. Now, let's put aside all of those specific examples for a while and instead consider for a moment the entire universe. Now, that's about as broad a perspective as you could ask for, isn't it? Physicists and cosmologists agree that the entire universe essentially consists of just two things, matter and energy. Chemistry itself is defined as the study of matter. At first glance, you might be inclined to think that this definition at least excuses us from having to contemplate the second great constituent of the universe, but that is ill-advised. You see, in recent centuries, we've become acutely aware of just how intimately connected matter and energy really are. As early as the 1700s, Western scientists had started to connect the flow of energy with changes in matter. In fact, every example that I just gave in the previous segment, from exploding fireworks to medication reacting in a sick patient's bloodstream, involved not just changes in matter, but also the transfer of energy. So it's practically impossible to divorce matter and energy. In the 1940s, Albert Einstein and his contemporaries made the staggering realization that matter does not simply act as a storage medium for energy, but that matter actually is energy. A concept made famous by Einstein's immortal energy-mass relationship, E equals mc squared. So chemistry can be defined as the study of matter. But since everything in the universe is made up of matter, and matter can be converted into energy, this oversimplified definition would basically mean that chemistry is the study of everything. At the risk of seeming a bit brash, chemistry is the study of everything. But chemistry does have a focus. There is a defining criterion for the central science. It's defined not by what subject is studied, but rather by the scale at which we study that subject. Chemists occupy themselves studying the universe at the atomic or molecular level. Now, while a particle physicist may be concerned with the interactions and behavior of the fundamental particles of the universe, like quarks, or a biologist might be interested in studying the behavior of organelles in living cells, speciation, or maybe even entire ecosystems, a chemist is more concerned with the scale that falls firmly in between these two disciplines, the scale of atoms and molecules. In chemistry, we study not only atoms, which are about one-tenth of a nanometer across. So small, in fact, that a billion of these can fit on the head of a pin. But we also study conjoined groups of atoms, called molecules, which can range in sizes from a fraction of a nanometer, like this diatomic hydrogen molecule used in rocket fuel, to small molecules like ibuprofen, which you may take as a pain reliever, 
all the way up to even larger molecules like the iron-containing heme that helps your blood carry oxygen. And we can continue all the way up to molecules of tremendous size like DNA, which can consist of billions of atoms. Now, this may seem small in the grand scheme of things. How can objects, although they consist sometimes of billions of atoms, still too microscopic for us to see, have a significant effect on the unfathomably large cosmos? Well, it turns out quite a bit. It's the fundamental forces governing the behavior of atoms and molecules at this very minute level, such as their masses, how they interact with one another, and how they gain and lose energy that drive the bulk properties of everyday objects that we're familiar with. Just like many drops of water form an ocean, so do many small interactions at the atomic and molecular level dictate the properties of the materials that we come into contact with every day, even those materials that make up our own bodies. Examples of this are all around us. Take the simplest of all elements, hydrogen. The structure and properties of a single hydrogen atom have been relentlessly studied over the past few centuries and are very well understood. Chemists can use this information to explain how the element hydrogen joins into molecules of two hydrogen atoms when found on the surface of the Earth, how its presence in compounds like water have shaped the biosphere, and we can even use this information to explain how stars, some of the largest objects in the universe, come into being furnish us with energy for billions of years, and then expire, sometimes catastrophically. Take the example of our sun, the engine of our solar system, which produces essentially all of the energy needed to sustain life on Earth. This massive celestial body, weighing in at just a shade less than one million times as massive as planet Earth, generates this energy using hydrogen atoms so small that it would take about five million of them lined up to stretch across the head of a pin. So, to understand the inner workings of something as huge as the sun, we have to understand the structure and properties of atoms, objects so small that they can't be seen by the human eye. As chemists, we study the behavior and properties of atoms and molecules in a lab, then multiply what we observe by factors so astronomical that they're truly staggering. And when we do that, more often than not, we can explain and even predict the behavior of macroscopic objects that affect our everyday lives. In the most remarkable cases, we have already employed this strategy to design new materials and medicines, and perhaps one day, we'll even create life from nothing more than a few elements and our deep understanding of chemistry. So, if we want to join this discussion, Understanding the most basic properties of atoms will be our first priority in this course. We'll spend some time getting familiar with the most recognizable visual tool of chemistry, the periodic table. This remarkable construct organizes the most fundamental substances that make up our universe in a way that spatially demonstrates many, many trends in their properties. This table was not only 200 years in the making, but encompasses thousands of years of human thought on the composition of matter. It truly is the pantheon of human understanding of the elements. But there's more than one way to organize these elements. We're going to discuss the traditional organizational scheme and also take a look at a few newer constructs that convey different types of information. But we won't be stopping there. Only about 100 elements are currently known to us, and even fewer of those form naturally. Just imagine a world in which there are only 100 substances to choose from for the construction of all things material. That's a pretty boring proposition. So we're going to quickly shift our attention from the structure of individual atoms to the many ways in which atoms can be combined to create a huge library of materials with properties so varied that the possibilities are virtually limitless. To add to the complexity, there's more than one way to combine atoms together into molecules with what we commonly refer to as chemical bonds. It's the structure of atoms which allows us to predict and explain their bonding, and in turn, the bonding which helps us to understand how molecules behave. From that point forward, we'll be able to explore a tremendous number of materials and processes. There is practically no question that we cannot begin to answer. Why is ice, solid water, less dense than liquid water? Well, this property of water is actually quite unusual, and it also turns out to be critical to the survival of life on Earth. 
The key to understanding it lies in understanding the details of how hydrogen and oxygen atoms bond to one another. Why does hydrogen mix with oxygen explosively, while helium does not? This little fact was tragically ignored by the engineers of the German Zeppelin known as the Hindenburg, which burst into flames over the skies of New Jersey in 1937, causing one of the most notable aviation tragedies in human history. Yet, we know exactly what it is about helium atoms that makes this gas so inert. As another example, consider life itself. Humanity's early, somewhat clumsy attempts to catalog living things were based upon how those things looked, a technique known as phenotyping. We just assumed the more two species look alike, the more closely related they must be. Now, however, the science of chemistry has been applied rigorously to the biological world, spawning a hybrid science known as molecular biology. And this has led to a whole new way of thinking about how species are interrelated. We compare them based upon the biomolecules making up their genes, DNA, a process known as genotyping. Now, genotyping has produced some truly revolutionary ideas about how different species have changed and evolved through time. And it all relies on understanding the fundamental forces holding individual molecules of DNA together. So the overriding theme of our course will stay true to this tenet, that understanding the behavior of atoms and molecules can lead to greater understanding of all the objects that they make up. We'll try to understand the inner workings of some familiar systems, like massive stars, complex biospheres, and forces affecting global weather patterns. But we'll always be looking from a unique perspective, the atomic and molecular one. We're going to see how some of the smallest particles in the known universe dictate the behavior of every natural and man-made system that we can imagine. So let's start at the beginning with the most recognizable of all tools in the arsenal of the chemist, the periodic table. Most of us are at least vaguely familiar with this funny-looking grid of elements with letters and data inscribed into each square, indicating some very important information about the structure and properties of each element. Without a proper understanding of the periodic table, it's practically impossible to develop a sound understanding of the fundamental structure of the atom, and subsequently, of molecules. So, in this lecture, we're going to begin with a very light introduction to the table and how it came to be. As we progress through the next few lectures and begin exploring the structure of the atom more, we'll continually return to the table and begin to decode the finer details in the information it contains. But for now, consider this. The idea that all matter in the universe is composed of fundamental particles is pivotal in the development of chemistry. But it's not a new idea. Thinkers from civilizations as old as ancient Greece and China independently advanced the theory that there must be just a few basic materials which combine in various ratios to form all other materials. Let's begin with the philosopher Thales, who's widely credited with being the first philosopher to grapple with the concept of fundamental units of matter. Thales offered a theory that all matter was created from just one fundamental substance, water. He suggested that this fundamental material took on various states, such as botanical water, geological water, meteorological water, and so forth, and that combining these different forms of water created all the material in the universe. But over time, other Greek philosophers began to find it difficult to believe that all complex materials were made of just one type of fundamental particle. And so they began entertaining the notion that there might be more than one basic material. It was the only way to explain the remarkable diversity of the matter they observed around themselves. Thales was about to be overruled. Empedocles is famous for first postulating that there were not one, but four fundamental substances. Earth, water, fire, and air. Now he called these fundamental substances elements, and theorized that they combine in various ratios to make up all the other materials in the universe. He seemed to be onto something here. Having a library of just a few fundamental substances meant that they might be combined in various ratios, thus creating a continuum of compositions, offering a buffet of materials that was virtually infinite. About a century later, the famous thinker Aristotle 
theorized that Empedocles' elements had specific properties that could be used to organize them. He suggested that earth is cold and dry, water is cold and wet, fire is hot and dry, and air is hot and wet. Of course, today we know that Empedocles' elements are not true elements. But that isn't what's most important about what came from this discourse. What is most important is this. Aristotle organized his elements spatially based on their properties. He created a graphical representation of the elements as he understood them, and his arrangement organized them by similarities and differences in specific properties. Now, you may find it hard to believe, considering it was first done with materials, none of which are actually elements. But this simple idea of arranging elements based on their properties is the essence of the modern periodic table. Now, let's fast forward through nearly 2,000 years of history, arriving in the 1700s. It was during this century that Western scientific thought was beginning to awaken from the Dark Ages, and a looming industrial revolution was expanding their imaginations and the bankrolls of quite a few of a generation of European aristocrats. With all the time and resources needed for scientific investigation, these wealthy scientific pioneers stood poised to make a series of scientific breakthroughs that would change their world forever. One such aristocrat was Antoine Lavoisier, a French nobleman with a keen curiosity about the nature of matter. It was Lavoisier and his contemporaries who first began to chip away at the two millennia old idea that water, air, earth, and fire are the fundamental elements of matter. For his part, Lavoisier did this by decomposing water in the presence of iron metal. Now, iron likes to rust. We all know this. And rusting of metal is a process in which the metal reacts to become what we would call a metal oxide. So when iron became iron oxide, snatching the oxygen from water, what remained was a gas made of what was left of the water molecules. Lavoisier demonstrated that he could collect this gas in a separate container, then burn it in air to regenerate water. He called his element hydrogen, meaning water maker, because it could be burned to make water. Now, stop and think about that for a moment. Clearly, water must be made from simpler materials. By disassembling it and then reassembling it, Lavoisier had effectively closed the book on a 2,000-year-old paradigm that water was an element. Elements cannot be disassembled and reassembled, but water can. Lavoisier and others continued work in this vein, cataloging a few dozen of the elements that we know today. In 1789, he very famously published what is commonly regarded as the first modern chemistry textbook. His work contained a list of elements which had been discovered up to that point in time. But a list is not a table. So how did the elements in Lavoisier's list ultimately become arranged in a table? That part of our story starts a generation later with a German scientist by the name of Johann Doberiner. Now He re-inspired the concept of organizing elements by their properties. In 1829, Doberiner noted that known elements with very similar properties tended to group themselves into groups of three. For example, lithium, sodium, and potassium are all soft metals that react readily with water to form very alkaline solutions. This property eventually led to them being dubbed alkali metals. Now, he also noticed that calcium, strontium, and barium all combine with oxygen in a one-to-one -one ratio and are commonly found in this state in nature, eventually earning them the classification of alkaline earth metals. Let's do a third example. A third example offered by Doberiner was this one, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Now, all of these elements are found naturally occurring as salts in combination with metals, like the sodium chloride and table salt. But Doberiner's triad model seemed to ignore a few relationships. For example, beryllium and magnesium, which were known in his day to act like alkaline earth metals. It was also increasingly unable to explain the discovery of new elements, such as rubidium and cesium in 1861, both of which seemed to crash the triad party by behaving very similarly to lithium, sodium, and potassium. Or that of fluorine in 1886, which behaves very similarly to the halogens. 
So in spite of Dobereiner's inspired effort, he was somewhat clearly destined to fail. It would be another generation before the puzzle of the elements finally started to give up its secrets. And the right man in the right place at the right time was a Russian chemist named Dmitry Mendeleev. Mendeleev played the same geometric game as Aristotle, but with two very important differences. First, he had 63 accurately known elements to work with instead of Aristotle's mistaken four. Second, he had the benefit of superior measurement techniques, which gave him the atomic masses of each element and a way to observe how they reacted with other elements. The genius that Mendeleev applied to this long list of elements was to arrange them in a grid based on their properties and their known atomic masses. He famously carried a deck of cards with him, one that he made himself, containing a card for each element. And the game that he played with these cards ultimately created the first generation of the modern periodic table. Let's take a look at the deck of cards that Mendeleev would be working with. Now, this is not an exhaustive deck of all the elements that he would have known about, but this is a really good sampling, and it's going to allow us to demonstrate his concept. Now, each card within the deck represents one known element from his day, and a few properties. For example, magnesium, which has a mass of 24.3, and an oxide in which one atom of magnesium combines with one atom of oxygen. So let me put my card back in the deck here. Now, remember that Mendeleev's deck would have more information, but I'm just going to use one particular characteristic to demonstrate exactly how he went about this. So here's our deck of cards again. Now, the first thing we have to do is remove hydrogen because hydrogen has a very special place. It doesn't quite fit in, and that actually was something that puzzled him a little bit, but we're going to get rid of it for now and think about the rest of Mendeleev's deck of cards. So let's get down to business. Aligning our cards in order of increasing atomic mass, starting with lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. As you can see, the mass is increasing consistently as we move from left to right across the row. And so far, notice that the properties all look fairly different. Right? Lithium combines with oxygen to form a two-to-one complex. Uh, carbon makes CO2, where there's two oxygens per carbon. Uh, we have nitrogen, which makes lots of different oxides. And fluorine, which tends to appear in metal salts. So a wide variety of properties when we align them in order of increasing atomic mass. Let's put our next card in place, though. Now, when we place sodium in our outline of cards here, you'll notice something's happened here. I've got a similarity between sodium's behavior, which forms a two-to-one complex with oxygen, and my first card, lithium's behavior. It also makes a two-to-one combination with oxygen. So what Mendeleev decided to do was not to place sodium at the end of the row, but rather to move it underneath of lithium. Now let's continue lining up our deck and see what happens. Magnesium, aluminum, silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine are next. And sure enough, when we do this, we notice that that same trend continues. Lithium and sodium having similar oxides, beryllium and magnesium having similar oxides, as well as boron and aluminum, carbon and silicon, and so on, all the way up to fluorine and chlorine, which both tend to be found as metal salts in nature. So by now, Mendeleev knew he was really onto something. So he continued, placing potassium at the beginning of yet another row because its oxide is also a two to one ratio, just like sodium and lithium. Calcium fits the trend as well. But once he got past calcium, he noticed something interesting, that he could get arsenic, selenium, and bromine, known elements of his day, to fit into his table if he placed them underneath of phosphorus, sulfur, and chlorine. But this left gaps in his table. And this is one of the really remarkable things about Mendeleev's periodic table he was able to determine that there must be two yet undiscovered elements no one had ever discovered before. And not only that, he was able to take a pretty good stab at predicting their atomic masses and their properties, specifically in our case, how they combine with oxygen. And sure enough, when these elements were discovered, they had properties that were strikingly similar to what Mendeleev had predicted. Mendeleev's grid-style table of the elements was so amazingly simple so accurate and so powerful that he was even able to predict the existence of properties of yet undiscovered elements by searching for those gaps in the patterns. But the periodic table is not just a relic of history. 
The modern periodic table contains not only the 90 or so naturally occurring elements, but nearly two dozen more which have been created in laboratories around the world over the years. The legacy of researchers like Mendeleev and Lavoisier is alive even today as modern chemists and physicists have pushed the boundaries of nature itself, extending the catalog of elements beyond those found in nature in search of new, man-made elements with yet undiscovered properties. For example, in 1955, at the Berkeley National Laboratory in California, a new element was created by smashing two others together with such force that they combined, forming a new, heavier element that, to the best of our knowledge, has never existed before. In honor of his contributions to our understanding, this element was named Mendeleevium. Even today, our quest to populate the periodic table continues. In 2010, a team of scientists working at the Joint Institute for Nuclear Research in Dubna, Russia, created the 117th element of the table. An element known as berkelium was bombarded with calcium atoms, moving at about one-tenth the speed of light in order to create a collision so forceful that the two atoms combined, creating yet another elemental substance that, to the best of our knowledge, has never existed before. This element is so new that as of this taping, it still hasn't been named. These newer elements give us great insight into the forces that hold atoms together and give them their characteristic properties. And with each new element discovered, we learn a little bit more about how the structure of the atom influences the properties of all matter in the cosmos. So let's sum up what we've discussed. We've discussed how chemists study practically everything, but that we do so on a scale unique to our science. We considered the remarkable fact that understanding the behavior and properties of particles smaller than a nanometer across can be used to predict and explain the properties of objects of all sizes, from the machinery of microscopic cells all the way up to immense celestial bodies. We talked about the concept of fundamental elements that can be combined to make all other substances we see, and how ancient philosophers like Aristotle, started us on the right track by proposing the existence of fundamental elements. We saw how it took a couple thousand years before some of those elements were correctly identified, and how it was a Russian chemist who played a famous card game with the list in his day to create a periodic table of the elements, one of the most recognizable and powerful scientific tools ever devised. Finally, we took a few moments to consider how the quest to identify and characterize new elements continues even today in the form of supermassive elements created under incredibly high energy conditions by physicists. The next 59 lectures are going to take us on a journey from the familiar to the unusual, from processes going on right outside your door to the other side of the galaxy. But it isn't the distance of the journey that is truly remarkable. What's most remarkable is that the journey will be viewed through the eyes of a chemist, constantly considering the roles of atoms, elements, and the bonds that they form in everything we see. So our first task is going to be to learn the language of chemistry, to understand how we measure and describe matter on the atomic and molecular scale. That will happen next time as we discuss matter and measurement.